Last week, we went over the convoluted founding story of Ulama, China's number two food delivery service after the newly IPO'd Meituan. Ulama was acquired by Alibaba for 9.5 billion dollars in April, the largest acquisition in Chinese internet history, and merged with Alibaba's new retail subsidiary Kobe last week. This is a two-part series, like our deep dive into bike sharing earlier this year, and it's meant to be listened to in the order that they're released. Better yet, you should listen to both last week's story on Ulama and our earlier episode on Meituan first before jumping in today. Basically, we are seeing the emergence of a new battlefront in China, a battle that is currently being called local services, bendi shenghuo, or pretty much the old. O2O online to offline businesses that included group buying and food delivery, but which is now increasingly being tied up with a concept known as new retail. You know, high tech supermarkets, grocery delivery, cashierless stores, stuff like that. And nowhere is this convergence of sorts more clearly demonstrated than in the recent Ulama and Kobe merger. And since we gave you a ton of detail. Maybe too much detail. Sorry, on Ulama last week. This week, you guessed it. We are going to talk about Kobe. What is this company? Why is it important? Why the merger? And what does this mean for the battle between Meituan and Alibaba? And why should you care? Well, this battle, like so many of the other battles we've covered so far in Tech Buzz, is actually a pretty good example of how China is further ahead in certain market segments. Versus the U.S., I mean, most of the same pieces and technologies exist, but China has rolled out many parts faster, and so we might see certain business dynamics emerge earlier than even here in Silicon Valley. Right. I mean, just in food delivery, a core reason behind Uber's jump in valuation recently, China is about twice as big as the U.S. with a thirty-three billion dollar market expected this year versus. Seventeen billion dollars here, and that's just one piece of the puzzle. So keeping an eye on this story might also inform those working on these sectors elsewhere, because you never know. Maybe Amazon, Uber, Instacart, or other internet giants are going to take a page out of the same playbook of Meituan or Alibaba can make it work, or learn from their mistakes if it doesn't. But tech buzzers will let you decide for yourself. Is new retail and local services truly a killer combo, and who might have the best shot at making it work, Meituan or Alibaba? The president's key economic team goes to China.、Uh, after a whole night thinking, I say I still want to do it. Hi everyone. We are Tech Buzz China by Pan Daily, powered by the Seneca Podcast Network. We are a weekly podcast focused on giving you a peek into what's buzzing within the tech community in China. We uncover and contextualize unique insights, perspectives, and takeaways on headline tech news that don't always make it into English language coverage, so you can be smarter about the world of China tech. Tech Buzz China is a part of Pandaily. dot com, an English language site that tells you everything about China's innovation. Hello, I'm one of your two co-hosts, Ying Ying Lu, and I'm your other co-host, Ray Ma. We love fans who write us reviews and give us detailed feedback. Thank you, Connor Leonard, Tapiwa Carlton, and、uh, Etse Parti. Also, to our new listeners over at Deal Street Asia, hello, and do tweet at us for Tech Buzz swag. We'd like to give a shout out to our partners at Sub China. In addition to our podcast here with Pan Daily, they publish the excellent Seneca Podcast, a weekly discussion of current affairs on China with journalists, writers, academics, policymakers, and business people. And Seneca has been adding steadily to its growing podcast network. There's Nui Voices, which features women, as well as the new China Econ Talk, and of course the Taishin Seneca Business Brief. Check these out, guys, wherever you get your podcast. If you enjoy listening to us, please do take the time to leave us a rating or reviews on iTunes, Facebook, or wherever you get your podcast. <music> Kobe, which literally means word of mouth, has led two lives. So no, you're not crazy if you think you've heard of this brand before. 
It was started in 2004 by an early Alibaba employee and initially focused on housing search. Then it tried to be the Craigslist and Yelp of China before being bought by Alibaba and merged into its Yahoo China division. None of those efforts worked, though, of course. And it's hard to say if Kobe was just too early in its timing or too unfocused or what. But by 2011, it was basically left for dead. By the time, four years later in 2015, when Alibaba officially revived and restructured the brand, everything had changed except the name. Yeah, because it wasn't a revival as much as a rebirth. In June 2015, Alibaba and Ant Financial put in 6 billion RMB, or almost 1 billion USD, and split ownership in Kobe 50 50 to fight against the still separately dueling Meituan and Dianping at the time. Even though the O2O online to offline local services market had already reached $30 billion in 2014, researchers estimated that the market penetration was just a paltry 4.4%. So that means everyone could see the growth potential, especially commerce-minded Alibaba, who was drooling after this ginormous market opportunity. Which might explain why it cannot help itself but jump into the fray, despite already having a horse in the race by way of portfolio company Meituan. But as we already know, Alibaba likes to own and not just influence as an investor. Either way, I wonder if that was the beginning of the end of their relationship. Because before they were the rivals they are today, Alibaba had led Meituan's Series B. But today, just three years later, Alibaba's Ulama and Kobe are named as main competitors in Meituan's IPO prospectus. So alliances, even if forged together by strategic equity investment, can be quite fleeting in Chinese tech. Right. But back to Kobe. While it began with a food and beverage or F&B restaurant business, much like a Yelp or a Dianping, Kobe 2.0, like its predecessor, always had grander ambitions from the start. In fact, its very first press release said it was eventually going to go into healthcare, supermarkets, and vending machines. And it pretty much does do everything now, having expanded significantly since launching three years ago. You can book travel, buy movie tickets, find a gym, do your laundry. But the main business still seems to remain F&B. Or at least that's what Meituan thinks. In its prospectus, Meituan names Kobe as its main competitor in its in-store business, which means the following. Quote, Allowing consumers to make reservations, line up virtually, place orders, purchase vouchers, and much more, addressing potential consumer demands and improving merchant service quality. At the same time, merchants are further enabled through technology that improves their IT and operations, accelerating their digitization. End quote. Simply put, Kobe and Meituan are both working on digitizing every aspect of the restaurant dine-in experience, not just what the consumer experience is, but also the back end as it operated by the restauranteur. In July, Kobe announced that it was going to apply new retail to the F&B business by introducing smart restaurants. What are smart restaurants, you ask? It's basically the same thing we just mentioned, but just taken to an extreme. And oh yeah, with AI. Yeah, as a consumer, you get AI recommendations on what to order. As a restaurant owner, you'll be able to manage your inventory, offer real-time discounts, maybe personalized offerings to customers, and more. Technically, you should be able to run your restaurant at a higher efficiency and for longer hours, like, for example, 24 hours a day. One chain signed on to be an early beta customer in January. After six months, the location grew revenues 40%, labor efficiency by three times, and had 37% higher table turnover rate. Based on these early promising results, Kobe has announced new partnerships and intends to remake 1 million restaurants into smart ones. Kobe has also worked with a convenience store called 24 Cien to pilot cashierless payments. While there is still a cashier in the store, customers with a Kobe app can just scan the goods and pay for the items in-app and show the receipt to the cashier as they leave, saving a lot of time and labor. It's also been using AI and facial recognition to help chains choose locations to expand to. Okay, if you're like me, you're probably thinking, that's cool, but also kind of gimmicky. Yeah, add AI to everything. Yeah, make everything robotic. 
But is that Alibaba's plan to win against Meituan? No, of course not. These are newer initiatives and make for good headlines. But the crux of the battle is still for all of local services, not just F and B. There's so much offline consumption that can be digitized. In China, it's popular to refer to the 30 trillion RMB of annual Chinese 社会消费 aka private consumption, sometimes also called household or just domestic consumption. That, by the way, equates to about four trillion U.S. dollars. And FMB, it accounts for just 12 to 15 percent of this number. Yes, and over 30 billion dollars of that in China is already online. But guess what else is also 30 billion? E-grocery in China. The U.S. again is about half the size of China. So naturally, beyond F and B, Kobe has pushed into other aspects of daily life, such as convenience stores and supermarkets. And the push has been very serious too. So most of you probably know about Singles Day or November 11th, which is commonly referred to as Shuang Shi Yi or Double Eleven in Chinese. It's the equivalent of Black Friday or Cyber Monday in China, and something that Alibaba invented, but is now probably the single most important day for the company. But you haven't heard much about Shuang Shi Er or December 12th, Double Twelve, which is also an Alibaba invention, but was a pretty lackluster affair until a few years ago, when a bunch of offline merchants adopted it as their own shopping holiday. We're talking large electronics stores, supermarkets, convenience store chains, and basically a lot of businesses with an offline presence who tried to make it into the O2O holiday of the year. It's still not that big, not compared to Singles Day anyway. But because Singles Day is so closely affiliated with Alibaba's Taobao and Tmall, other players like Baidu and Meituan have been trying to get a piece of the action on Double Twelve instead. But Alibaba wasn't going to let them get away with that so easily. Beginning in 2015, Alibaba has been trying to brand Double Twelve as a Kobe holiday, and last year it upped the stakes by having its most popular app. Mobile Taobao include a special promotional link for Kobe Double Twelve Shopping Holiday. And how has that worked out? Well, on last year's Double Twelve, Kobe issued 140 million coupons on behalf of 1 million merchants, and induced what they said were 65 million transactions in 300 cities. Is that good or bad? I don't know. Obviously, these numbers are large and impressive, and there seems to be significant growth from the year before. And unlike Singles Day, these coupons are not used online, but redeemed in the actual store usually. But since many articles talked about how you could buy 70 RMB worth of goods with just 25 RMB cash on this day, meaning there were significant subsidies being given out. Can you really say this was really successful, or just a really expensive customer engagement strategy? Nothing beats free money. Alibaba has plenty of cash, though, so I would expect this to continue for a while, or at least until they're sure they've won this market. Now that Kobe has merged with Ulama, maybe they will. The combined company's coverage, at least, is immense. Together, they have 3.5 million merchants across 676 cities. And Kobe alone has 167 million MAU. Couple that with Ulama's nearly 700k delivery workers, Meituan should be very, very worried. Actually, they are worried. As we've already said, they very responsibly highlighted these risks in their prospectus. The question, though, is who is set up better to win in this space? And by this space, we mean local services. Originally, the focus had been on food delivery, but now digitizing offline retail, or what's called new retail, xin ling shou, is also front and center. Yeah, as we said in the last episode, according to Jack Ma, new retail is quote a seamless merger of offline, online, and logistics for a dynamic new world of retailing. End quote. That means e-grocery, cashierless stores, high-tech retail, and all that good stuff. With both Alibaba and Meituan, the emergence of local services in new retail as a key business unit has been very obvious. In January, Kobe changed from reporting to Ant Financial to reporting directly to Daniel, the CEO of Alibaba Group. If you can't quite remember what the difference is between the two, we highly suggest you listen to our episode 11, which does a deep dive on Ant. 
Now that Kobe is combined with Ulama, it is still directly overseen by Daniel. Remember too that on the retail side, Alibaba has significant retail partnerships and investments in the form of Yintai, Sanjiang, and RF Mart, all large department store and supermarket chains. In consumer electronics, it's got Suning. In fact, it has invested nearly ten billion dollars into traditional brick and mortar retail since 2015. But beyond that, perhaps most importantly, it's got Alipay. And because Ulama, Kobe, Alipay, Taobao, they're all one big happy family, they can all agree to share all of their data. Which leads to Kobe being able to offer you a discount voucher to karaoke in the mall when you finish your Harry Crab dinner, because Alipay data shows that you have a 30% chance of wanting to sing your heart out after a gourmet seafood meal, which is either creepy or convenient, depending on where you stand on the consumer privacy spectrum. Right. But if you're the merchant, then you love this solution. You also love how you don't need to deal with all the hassles of managing a mall membership program, which, by the way, is very common in China. Statistics show that only 30% of visitors return to the same mall within six months. But if they have a membership with perks and you can keep track of who they are and push them timely discounts regardless of location, then maybe you won't be wasting two thirds of your foot traffic. Not just for mall operators, but also for store owners, you don't need to manage your own members or loyalty programs either. You know those buy nine get your tenth boba milk tea free deals where you have to remember to carry around this flimsy paper card and get it stamped. Kobe can manage that for you automatically, and when shoppers come into your store, instead of bothering the salespeople for promotions. They can just scan the Kobe QR code at the entrance and get all the coupons they need. Even for a small store, this could save you an entire one or maybe even two salespeople, which is a very significant cost savings. That's actually what the app really is. Unlike Meituan, which is really still very much reviews based, Kobe is all about drawing you in with deals and allowing you to order inside the app as much as possible. It's much more on the spot promotion and order completion, much more transactional, but at the merchant's location versus Meituan and Ulama, which still focus on delivering to the home. Meituan obviously has seen the same opportunity, and was already starting to experiment with its own offline stores. By mid 2017, at the time, it said to its investors that it expects to be the most aggressive investor in the offline retail space. It officially announced last November that it would increase its focus on new retail, and now it breaks out those revenues separately under new initiatives in its financial reports. Even on the logistics side, it's tried to follow in Ulama's footsteps by focusing less on food and more on delivering things in general. Launching a Shan Go product in July that delivers not just food but also groceries, convenience store goods, flowers, jewelry, and other things that are not quite so high frequency as food, but would still benefit from delivery. It's also been testing robot deliveries, but let's not get into that today because these initiatives are still so early. Instead. You've heard us talk about Kobe and local services and new retail for the last twenty minutes. Let's get another voice on the show, shall we? We'll have our friend Ed, who's been looking into new retail for a while. Ed, can you introduce yourself briefly to Tech Buzzers? Hello, my name is Ed Sander of China Talk in the Netherlands, and ever since working as an international volunteer in the city of Xi'an, I have been writing. Giving lectures and guiding study trips for individuals and groups, with a special interest in mobile digital innovation and new retail. More recently, all right. In case that's not clear, Ed takes people to China, not the Netherlands, for the study trips, and he's recently done some fantastic videos on new retail that you can find on his website at chinatalk.nl. Okay, Ed. What do you think is the main benefit of Alibaba now combining Ulama and Kobe? There's some interesting aspects about the combination of local services and new retail.、Uh, one part is, of course, the delivery, with the army of Kuaidi of couriers that Alibaba now has available after acquiring, fully acquiring Ulama. It can probably use these in other areas as well. Another thing is that with Kobe and Ulama、uh, 
uh, merging in, in the back end, not so much in the front end, but in the back end, they will probably be able to offer a more full service package to the merchants. Of course, Ulema is doing food delivery. There is other services that Kobay offers more in the customer acquisition and online presence that can complete the uh, service package that is, is being offered to the merchants. So that's where I expect synergies and a better full experience for on the merchant side. Now on the customer side, I expect another really um, fierce war between Meituan Jianping and Erlema, as we've seen before between Meituan and Jianping before they merged together. So it will probably result in more customer discounts and, and, and merchants subsidizing. I'm not so sure that's a good thing, that Chinese people will be having such cheap fast food delivery. But I suppose as long as they're also ordering fresh groceries with the same infrastructure and eating healthy, maybe it's not all bad. But Ed, is there anything the West can learn from this? As far as the question is concerned of how the West can learn from these developments in China, I have always personally been very skeptical about the possibilities of copying Chinese concepts to other markets. Most of all because the conditions are very different in most other markets. The, the, the labor costs are still quite low in China. And that's how you can, for instance, apply a lot of order picking people inside the Germa stores and lots of couriers uh, delivering food and, and groceries. Also, the population density in the Chinese cities is very high. If you look at food delivery, for instance, in the Netherlands, uh, it's mostly fast food because eating out is quite expensive and it's really considered to be like a bit of a special occasion if you go and eat out. So you wouldn't really have a courier deliver um, like a real meal that's not like fast food. Um, but if, if we look at what we can learn from these Chinese internet companies and these developments, I think the most interesting thing is how Chinese internet companies div diversify. Whereas in the West, we tend to stay sort of like in our own in our own field, in our own area. And I just think, I think where we can really learn, the West can really learn from, from China. Hema, by the way, is Alibaba's tech-infused supermarket that we will have to get into another time. Anyway, I agree that operationally, there might not be too much in common, but from a high-level consumer needs and trends perspective, there's still a lot to digest and maybe incorporate. Totally agree with you there. But I also agree with Ed and his point about the sprawling, endless business expansions that these Chinese tech giants take on. Because perhaps at the end of the day, this is not as much a battle between Meituan and Alibaba as it is of Tencent, which of course owns part of Meituan, and Alibaba, and their two divergent approaches to empire building. If it hasn't been obvious from our prior coverage on these two companies, Tencent invests while Alibaba acquires. Perhaps that's an oversimplification, but Tencent is often content to take a minority stake and stay there, while Alibaba likes to incubate and spin out, acquire, or set up JVs, often with a majority ownership position. Or even if it began as a strategic investment, the goal is often for Alibaba to acquire outright, as in the case of Ulama. Tencent's strategy might be faster and less risky, since it's more light touch and less capital intensive after all. But Alibaba has more control and can integrate much more tightly. While Tencent has created a superstar team, we're talking about JD, Meituan, DD, and all that, Alibaba has a family with a capital F. They share Jack Ma's blood, while Tencent's companies only share Pony Ma's friendship. Well, friendship and funds. Yeah, integrating across two independent companies headed by two hotshot CEOs is obviously going to be more difficult than Alibaba CEO Daniel Zhang just issuing an order that says, Hey guys, your units are now combined. Have fun working together. Here's your new KPI. Beat Wang Xing. And now Meituan is a public company with investors scrutinizing its every move. Its latest financial report shows that food delivery still makes up the bulk of its revenues at 60%, while new initiatives, which combines mobike, grocery delivery, and other stuff, is only 14%. 
It's already promised investors it won't go after ride-hailing, despite a much-publicized attempt to go head-to-head with DD earlier this year. Can it convince investors new retail is a sector it must be in? That will only push back profitability even further, I'm sure. And is it even necessary to do so, with Tencent also having mirrored many of the same moves Alibaba's made? We won't list all of them here, but Wang Xing sure has a lot of teammates to buddy up with. As much as I am a fan of Wang Xing, I think he has his work cut out for him here. Alibaba is super serious about local services, and the amount of data it has on its users, coupled together with the amount of cash it's willing to go through to back these initiatives, you know, based on its subsidies for Ulama and Kobe Double Twelve Shopping Festival we talked about earlier. Really makes me favor Alibaba more in the long run. Not to mention that these new businesses require significant amounts of operating know-how. Alibaba is a much older and more experienced business, and being the leader in e-commerce means that it has been dealing with supply chains and suppliers for much longer than Meituan has. I'm also going to cast my vote with Alibaba, for now. Yeah. So while we're not discounting Tencent, it's got its hands full now with its own troubles. So what do y'all think? Is Alibaba's Ulama and Kobe combo the killer duo that's gonna shake up Meituan, or is this still too early to tell? Let us know by tweeting at us at TechBuzzChina. Okay, that's all for this week, folks. Thanks for listening. We really enjoyed putting this together, and we're always open to any comments or suggestions. As always, you can find us on Twitter at the Pan Daily, at Tech Buzz China, and my personal Twitter account is spelled G I N Y G I N Y, and my Twitter is spelled R U I M A. We will be back here same time next week. Tech Buzz China by Pan Daily is powered by the Seneca Podcast Network. Pandaily. dot com is an English language site that tells you everything about China's innovation. Our producers are Bonnie Zhang and Kaiser Guo. Our intern is Wang Menglu. Hold up. 